Judges 7, verse 15. As soon as Gideon heard the dream that uh, one of the other soldiers had been telling his dream to one of his other guys, as soon as Gideon heard the telling of the dream and its interpretation, he worshiped, circle worshiped, and he returned to the camp of Israel and said, arise, for the Lord has given the host of Midian into your hand. And he divided the 300 men that were with him into three companies and put trumpets into the hands of all of them and empty jars with torches inside the jars. And he said to them, look at me, circle, look at me, and do likewise, circle, do likewise. When I come to the outskirts of the camp, do as I do, circle, do as I do. When I blow the trumpet and all who are with me, then blow your trumpets also on every side of all the camp and shout for the Lord and for Gideon. So Gideon and the hundred men who were with him came to the outskirts of the army camp at the beginning of the middle watch, circle middle watch, when they had just set the watch and they blew the trumpets and smashed the jars that were in their hands. And the three companies blew their trumpets and also broke their jars. They held in their left hands the torches and in their right hands the trumpets to blow. And then they cried out, underline this phrase, a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. And every man stood in his place around the camped out army and all the army ran. They cried out and they fled. When they blew the 300 trumpets, underline the sentence, the Lord set every man's sword against his comrade and against all the army. And the army fled as far as Beth Shittah towards Zerah, as far as the border of Abel Meholah by Tabath. And the men of Israel were called out from Naphtali and from Asher and from all of Manasseh. These are three different uh, Israelite tribes. And they pursued after Midian. Gideon sent messengers throughout all the hill country of Ephraim, which is also another Israelite tribe, saying, come down against the Midianites and capture the waters against them as far as Beth Barah and also the Jordan River. So all the men of Ephraim were called out and they captured the waters as far as Beth Barah and also the Jordan. And they captured two princes of Midian, Oreb and Zeb. And they killed Oreb at the rock of Oreb and Zeb they killed at the wine press, circle wine press of Zeb. And they pursued Midian and they brought the heads of Oreb and Zeb to Gideon across the Jordan. Have you ever wanted life to be better than it was? Have you ever hoped that a coming year is better than the one you just went through? Have you ever prayed that 2020 would end? Praise God in heaven. And yeah, but now guess what? Here we are in 2021. And you know what's interesting? Is I planned this series out, Disrupted, last summer. And I was gonna end it right before Christmas, right before we did our, our Christmas season and then start a new series. And when I started getting into the life of Gideon, I realized this guy's life is just like ours. And I extended this series into this year and What's interesting is this sermon that I'm going to speak on right now, I just happened to land on this Sunday, the first Sunday that I'm going to preach in this year, almost like God's real. And the whole point of this sermon today is how can life be better than it was? How can what we've gone through in difficulty, how can we look forward and have our future be better than what we just went through? So I want you to rewind 2020 in your mind. Think about it, ready? Look, look, look at me. A year ago this Sunday, so the second Sunday of January, 2020, a year ago. Think about what you were doing and what was going through your head at that time. I can tell you what was going through, through my head. We had just come out of the holidays again, and I started to hear some people had gotten sick because we have the flu season every year. That's why we call it a flu season, right? So there are people getting sick and... This weird thing we heard was coming out of China. And many Americans thought, wow, that's on the other side of the world. That'll never get here. And then we, you know, we heard Italy get really sick and all these other nations get really sick. And we realized, wow, it's, it's coming here. 
What we didn't realize it is it was already here. We just didn't know it yet. And so now the holiday season goes by and we're coming to March. And I remember March because the United States started going to lockdown. First time in American history that the American government told churches what they can and can't do and if they can be open or not and how many people can come to a church or not. Also, they started telling what businesses can be open and what businesses can't be open. Even businesses that sold the same thing, they said, you have to shut down, but Costco can be open. And so we realized in our country that all of a sudden people were making choices for us that we had no say over. For the first time in American history, one of the freest countries in, 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 in the history of the world we're in right now. And all of a sudden, our government is telling us how to live our lives in certain respects. And, and to some degree, they needed to because we needed to be safe. But I want you to realize this. When we look back at 2020, we thought, oh, that's going to pass on by. by. By April, it'll be over. And then I heard people saying, you know what? Just wait till the summer because there's no way a virus lasts for the summer. And then we got to the fall and like, oh, it'll be t- it can't last this long. And then it's Christmas and now we're here. And the reason I tell you that is this. Some of the challenges you have faced this last year, some of us got sick, we got COVID. Some of us went to the hospital. Some of us buried people this last year and weren't even able to go to their funeral. Some of us had heartache this last year. And I wanna wanna lay this out for you. In 2021, how can 2021 be better than 2020 if some of the things that happened in 2020 continue into this year? Ready? Because some of us emotionally go, I can't do it anymore. I, I can't do it anymore. My, my marriage is struggling. I'm a student. My school is struggling. My job is struggling. I had to give up my business, blah, blah, blah. We look at all these things and go, I, I'm overwhelmed. I can't go on. I'm going to lay something out for you that I hope changes your life. Because 2021 can be your best year, but it might not be your best year because you make more money. It might be your best year because you come closer to Jesus. That your life transforms because you become a woman of God that you weren't in 2020, that you become a man of God that you weren't in 2020. And this talks about how that can happen this year. If you got your notes, pull them out. Number one is this, God precedes the battle. God precedes the battle. Your notes should be inside your bulletin. If you're watching online, at the top of the comment section on Facebook, you'll see a link for my notes. Click on that link and my notes will pop up. But number one is this, God precedes the battle. Have you ever been scared? Our nation lived in fear. Maybe you live in fear of getting sick, of going to the hospital, of dying, of people around you, your kids getting sick, grandpa getting sick. This whole last year, many of us have felt fear and insecurity that we've never felt in our whole life. Insecurity about our job, insecurity about finances, insecurity about our marriage. Many of us have felt insecurity in places that are like, I've never felt this way in my whole entire life. Ready? God brought us to a battle in 2020, and many of us were not ready. Our marriages weren't ready. Our emotional state wasn't ready. Our jobs weren't ready. Churches weren't ready. You want to know what's so sad for me? is we're now going on a year of almost being in lockdown, close to a year. It's going to be Easter, which was the first Sunday that churches weren't allowed to be together last year. And that's coming up in about two months. We are going on a year and some churches haven't even been open one time. There are churches that were able to be open. Like, I'm not even talking about breaking the law. I'm talking about like government saying, hey, you can be open. This many people can come, blah, blah. You have to have these things in place, blah, blah. And they still didn't open. And that, that I'm going, dude, this is the, you, you're built for the battle, son. The church is built for this moment. And so may, many churches, are, hey, we're just not going to be open because we're just, we're just going to love people by not being open. <laughs> what? That's like a doctor's office going, hey, you know what? I'm kind of scared of, of sick people. We're just going to close down until everybody's better. What do you, why do you exist, doctor, if you close when people are sick? Like, So, and then the church is like in this moment, like people are emotionally and spiritually just tore up and shredded and churches are going, hey, you know, we're just going to wait a year. 
and just let everybody die spiritually. We're gonna let their marriages train wreck. We're gonna have suicide rates are going up. We're just gonna tap out and our doors are gonna be shut, but we're gonna love people by not being near them. And I was just going, what is going on? Like you're built for the battle. We are built for these moments. But you know what it exposed? Watch, battles expose your weakness. Battles expose where you are weak. It exposes where you're weak mentally. It exposes where you're weak spiritually. It exposes where you're weak in your addictions. Many of us in 2020, we went backwards in our spiritual growth. There were areas of all of our lives where we're like, we struggle with alcohol and we're like, the minute we felt panic, we felt weakness, we just went right back to the bottle. Or we went right back to smoking. And things that we tried to get rid of, the drugs we tried to get out of our lives, man, we just, we just reverted right back to that relational things, we started sleeping around and, and just because we wanted somebody to be near us. We went right back to porn. We went right back to the, the, the weaknesses of our lives. We, just, we, just, we regressed right back into those weak parts of our lives. And you know why that happens to all of us? Is because God, God brings us to a battle and if you're not ready to fight, you, be, you panic. And when you panic, you don't stay focused. The church lost its focus in America because it's not built for the battle. And I lay that all on the shoulders of the pastors. Pastors allowed their people to think that church was about ease and comfort rather than church is about the battle. It's about loving people through difficulty. And if there's ever been a time in difficulty, here it is. This is, this is the moment where the church stands up and goes, know the love of God. Let's go through the battle. Knowing God isn't no battle. Knowing God is when the battle comes, God is with us. And that's exactly what we see in this point with with Gideon. God has called Gideon to a battle. He's scared out of his mind, but he wants to go through the battle because he wants the blessing of God. And I've said this many times, listen to me. The blessing of God that many of us want is on the backside of a battle. We, we don't get the blessing on the front side of, of, of the battle. We have to be faithful through the battle and God, because he's faithful to us, gets us through it and then blesses us on the backside. It's like when you get paid, you go to work, you flip those burgers or you make that sale at the, you sell your bolts or whatever you do at work. And guess what? At the end of the end of the week, you get a paycheck. And it might be only like $14 or whatever, but you take your pastor out for a cup of coffee. But like you get a paycheck. Why? Because you worked hard. You did some work and now you get paid. What's bad is when you get paid and you don't have to work. We call that a stimulus check in our culture. But really what it is, all we're doing is stealing from the future. It's like taken from your kids or your grandkids. Like there's no free money. It comes from somewhere. It just happened to be coming from the future. Now understand this, ready? When you work and you get a paycheck, that's the blessing of hard labor. Same thing is true spiritually. Does God want to bless us? Yeah, God wants to bless your life. Spiritually, physically, mentally, emotionally, sometimes financially. But watch, God's blessing doesn't come on the front end. We don't get paid before we go to work. God's blessings on the back end Oftentimes the blessing of God hides on the other side of battle. And when you come through the battle, because God is faithful, now he blesses us here. But he expects faithfulness. And that's what we see in point number one. God precedes the battle. God's already in the battle before we get there. As the Israelite nation included the worship of false gods, namely Baal and Asherah, with their worship of the true God, God disrupted their lives by bringing foreign invaders into their land called the Midianites. So watch what's happening here. Listen, Israel struggled with worshiping false gods. It it struggled with idolatry in primarily two gods, Baal and Asherah. It's a male and female fertility God. And the reason they struggled with that was the reason, the, the way you gained wealth was so your animals reproduced. So you'd pray to the God of fertility that your animals would would produce and not die. The way you'd take care of those animals was have a big family, produce a bunch of children. So you'd continually pray to Baal and Asherah, the male and female fertility gods, please give me children, 
bless my children, bless my animals. And they also kind of wanted to worship the true God, but they wanted to add a bunch of idols in with the true God worship. God punished them by sending the Midianites into their land to overtake them until they cried out to God. And now God's going to send them Gideon, who's scared for the battle, but is willing to go. And here's, my, here's our first uh, principle. The future God has for believers often has challenges and blessings. Do you ever wonder why following God can be hard? You ever wonder why, if I'm following God, why is my marriage so hard? If I'm following God, why is school so hard? I'm, I'm sticking, staring at a Zoom meeting for my classes. I don't even feel like I'm learning anything. And I'm sick and tired of looking at these boxes of people. Sometimes they're not even people, it's just a name. Why, if I'm following God, is life hard? Well, guess what? Part of that reality is you haven't been taught how to walk through difficulty. Because we have a culture that tells you to rely on your feelings. Ready? Listen to me. Write this down on, on a piece of paper or on your face. Write it backwards so that when you look in the mirror, you'll read it correctly. Ready? I want, here's what I hope for you this year. Out of this first point, stop being addicted to your emotions. Stop being addicted to your emotions. What do I mean by that? I mean this. Our culture has taught us, how do I feel about my life? Let me, let me, let me see how I feel. Is life good for me? Let, me? let me think about it. I don't feel good. No, life's bad. Do I feel good about my life right now? Yeah, life's awesome. I make a lot of money. Awesome. But then the next moment I feel bad about my life. And you know what helps us do that is the piece of glass you hold in your hand. That piece of glass is a form of addiction. Many of us can't, can't even think about turning it off and putting it in a drawer for 24 hours. Like when you think about that, you go, I, I, I get fidgety. I keep going like this on my empty hand. My thumbs go like this. Because we're addicted. We're addicted to our phones. And you know, one thing that comes out of being addicted to your phone is your phone continually tells you what's my self-worth. How do I feel about myself? Do people like my picture? Do I have followers? Did somebody unfriend me? Even Facebook, you know, will ask you like, hey, what's on your mind? Or how do you feel today, Jim? At the end of the day, who cares how I feel? Because how I feel will deceive me. I need to make, I need to make my choices not based on how I feel, but what's on what's true. You make your life decisions have to be on not how I feel. They have to be on what's true because my, my emotions will deceive me, but truth will never deceive me. And Gideon here is going to have to make a decision not on how he feels, but on what's true about God. And it's going to lead him to victory. Being afraid, God sent him down at night to hear a Midianite soldier describing a dream of their defeat to another soldier. So this happened uh, the last time I, I spoke on this right before Christmas. And if you remember, here's what happened right before this story I'm preaching on. Right before this, Gideon's scared out of his mind because he's not a killer, he's not a warrior, but he has to go down and take on 150,000 trained killers that are, that are all camped out in his nation of Israel on the Je at the Jezreel Valley. So God goes, here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna send you down to the army. I just want you to listen. And the story right before this is Gideon goes down in the dark. It's at night. And he's listening to two Midianite soldiers talking to each other. So Gideon's in the weeds in the dark, listening. He's a creeper. Listening in the weeds. And two soldiers are talking to each other like guys do. Hey, man, dude, I got to tell you something. I had the weirdest dream last night, bro. What was it? <laughs> Check this out. So I just fell asleep and it was weird because this little piece of bread came rolling out of the hills. This little like muffin of bread was rolling down the, the hills and our whole army was under this huge tent and this little piece of bread rolled down and clunked into our tent and the tent fell down on all of us and we all died. Isn't that weird? And so Gideon's like listening to the guy going, that is a weird dream. Like, that's, 
you know, what, what are you eating? Was it mushrooms on your uh, pizza or what was that? Like, and you know what? And you know what the interpretation? So he's talking to one of his guys, one of the soldiers. And the, the, the soldier that he's telling it to doesn't go, yeah, that's weird, dude. You need to, you know, get better dreams or whatever. The guy interprets it as, you know what that is? That's that guy, Gideon, from Israel coming out of the hills and killing us all. That's the interpretation of a dream about bread and a tent. And Gideon from that dream, right before the verse I read you, goes, I know God's with me. God's already given us victory. I just have to go to war. God's gonna bring me to the battle, but God's gonna get me through it because he's already in the battle. And he brings us to our point, ready? Ready? What God has called you to, he is already at. Woo, write that down. Tweet that. What God has called you to, he's already at. You know, the problem with 2020 is you weren't ready emotionally, physically, mentally for a, for a hard year. You thought you were just gonna fly right through like, like many of our other years. Instead, it was one of the most difficult years that any of us have probably ever faced. And you know what? Most of us weren't ready. And I I wanna bring this to you. 2021 can be your best year if you're following Jesus. It might not be your best year financially. You might lose people that you love this year too. Or there's gonna be difficulty in 2021. But here's the point. The point isn't if you follow God, you won't have problems. The point is when difficulty comes, are you gonna follow God? God's gonna bring you to a battle. It's coming. It's coming. But the the beauty of the moment isn't, am I going to have a battle? The beauty of the moment is when God brings me to a battle, he's already going to give me victory because he's already in my future. Some of you guys better reconnect and stop thinking about lunch. Ready? Look at me. God's already in your future. He's God. He already exists in your future. Where you're going, he already is. So trust him through the battle because he's there for you. He's already on the backside of the battle, ready to bless you. We're on this side of the battle. And God says, come on, keep coming through the battle. We just got to work our way faithfully through the battle. And on the backside, God wants to bless our lives. Why? Because God's already, he's already gone ahead of us. He, He already gave that dream to the Midianite soldier so that Gideon could be encouraged to go, I'm going to go to battle and God will bless my, bless my life. God's going to give me victory because he's already in my future. I remember when Caleb was young. I have a son. He's 6'3 now, but he used to be micro. And as a parent, so parents in here will remember these moments. When your child is a crawler, a little rug rat, on, on, you know, her hands and knees crawling around on the floor, as a parent, you wonder after a while, When's my kid going to walk? Because as a parent, you go, it's not normative for you to crawl your whole life if you have the ability to walk. Like, you need to develop the ability to walk if you have the ability to walk. So as parents, after a while, your kid's been crawling around, you kind of go, hey, you know what? Kid's been, you know, crawling a while. Like, when's he going to walk? So as a parent, you go, okay, let's, let's try this. And you set your kid up, you know, on a table or whatever. Your kid's hanging onto a table and your kid starts to realize, hey, I've got legs that can hold me upright. And then as a parent, you go, hey, now we're going to try to walk. And your kid slowly like will let go of a table. And these microscopic steps happen. But you as a parent, you're like, come on, come on, Caleb, come on. And why do you want that as a parent? Because you want your kid to grow up. You want your kid to like be free and like have a whole new mode of transportation called your legs. But what's the parent doing? Helping the kid across difficulty. Hey, I'm teaching you a new way of living, but you got to do the work. You got to come to me. Listen to me. I can't walk for my kid. I can't walk for Caleb. Caleb's got to walk for himself, but I will help him to develop walking, but he has to do work. 
Here's the point. When you get to a battle, you got to go to battle. You want a better marriage? You've got to work on your marriage. You want to be a better student? You got to work through difficulty being at a Zoom meeting. Listen, you have to go to work. You have to go through the battle to get the blessing on the backside. Ready? Listen to me. Here's one of the most deceptive parts of being a human is we think, I just want the blessing without having to go to the battle. I want the victory without ever going to, to the battle. And that's a deceptive way of thinking about it because you don't get a check unless you go to work. You don't eat unless you get paid. You starve if you don't get money and you get money by working. And it's the same thing in our spiritual lives. You want the best things in life? Go to battle, go to work. Husbands, love your wives. I know she can be hard. I know she can be disrespectful. I know she says things that hurt you, hurt you. I know she tears you down. I know you want to leave your home. I know 2020 was hard for some of you and you went back to relationships you shouldn't have been in. By the way, if you're married, your dating life is over. Let me just be clear about that because our culture doesn't seem to understand that. You know what? Work hard on your marriage. Don't leave your marriage. Don't leave your wife. Work hard on your marriage. Love your wife. Love her. That's your calling from God as a man of God. Wives, I know sometimes you want to kick your husband to the curb and he's the worst guy that has God ever made. He's a tool bag in a bag of tools. Okay, I get it. It can be hard to live with a man. They're detached. They don't understand you. They don't walk alongside of you. They don't fill your emotional cup. I get it. But ladies, you'll destroy your home if you don't love your husband. Love him. Be respectful. Build into your marriage. Don't, tear, don't pull away from it. Love your husband even when he's unlovable. Bring the best out of him because it'll be the best for your marriage. But the, point I, the reason I bring that up is if you don't work on those things, you don't get blessing. The thing that you want, if you don't work on it, doesn't come about. It doesn't magically appear. Work has to happen for a result to come about. Everybody with me? That's the battle. It's not some mythical battle that I'm talking about. I'm talking about like real life things. Work hard on what you want as an end result and God will bless it. Number one, God precedes the battle. Be encouraged that God's already ahead of you. Number two, God gives wisdom for the battle. God gives wisdom for the battle. After hearing the spirit of fear in the army, that Gideon just listened to this dream, Gideon splits his 300 men into three groups and they each take a clay pitcher, a torch, and a horn. At the middle watch of the night, which is about 10 to midnight, 10 p.m. to midnight, the three groups of, of the hundred apiece climb the nearby foothills and surround the army of 150,000 killers on the Jezreel Valley floor. On cue, they removed the pitcher from the torch, broke the jar, shouted, and then blew 300 horns. So here's where this happened. Here's a uh, Google map of the area. The Midianites, because Israel, which is that little sliver on the left-hand side of um, between the Mediterranean Sea and the Jordan River right there, that's Israel. Because Israel decided to worship other gods along with the uh, true God, God let the Midianites come up from the south and into the Jezreel Valley, and now they're camped there eating all their food and taking over their nation. They cry out to God. God raises up Gideon, who's never been a fighter his whole life, but God's going to use him. And um, Gideon now has raised up 300 guys that are going to surround this valley and make a bunch of chaos and create havoc inside this camp at night. Here's what the um, Jezreel Valley looks like today. We will go visit it when we go there. Um, this would have been like from Gideon's vantage point, he's up on the foothills. The whole, this massive army like locusts is laying down in this valley at night. And think about a hundred guys on this rock, a hundred guys spread out on that far hill to the left and a hundred guys way in that, in that back foothills. They all spread out and they take a clay pitcher with a, with a little torch in it and a horn. Now, I don't want you to think of a trumpet like Dizzy Gillespie trumpet. 
it was this. It's called a shofar, and it's a hollowed out ram's horn. And they use it all the way through ancient Israel to call people to battle or to call them to war. So they would blow the shofar, and imagine, it's totally dark. It's 3,000 years ago. No artificial lights. It's pitch black in that valley. They've spread out all around this army. They got their little torch. They got to imagine, hey, I need you to go to war. Cool. What kind of gun do I get? Ah, you don't get a gun because um, they're not made yet. Uh, okay, what sword do I get? Ah, you don't get a sword either. How about a nice javelin? Nah, I can't, I can't have you have that either. Well, what are we getting to go to war against trained killers? I'm going to give you this and a clay pot, and a little baby torch. Oh, so I'm going to die, is what you're basically saying. Like, get away. (laughs) Right? Nope. Gideon has a plan. And he spreads out around this valley, and they shatter. Imagine, guys are sleeping. They're half awake in the dark. They've just set a watch at about 10 p.m. You know, three quarters of 150,000 guys are sleeping. And all of a sudden they wake up, smash, a sword for Gideon and the Lord. It's echoing throughout this whole valley. They, they, they wake up, they see little torches all around them. They're thinking, there must be a million guys around us with swords. We're going to get slaughtered down here. They blow the shofar. There's all this chaos in the valley. The guys wake up, they're pulling their swords out and God throws them into chaos and confusion in the darkness and they start killing each other. And here's the principle. Doing the will of God doesn't rely on emotions, but often takes intelligence, strategy, skill, determination, and hard work. Doesn't that encourage you? Hey, you know what I want to encourage you? Is that the good life takes hard work. Stop waiting for somebody else to give you the good life. You want a good marriage? Work hard on your marriage. You want to... Good times at your job, be a good employer. You want people that work hard for you? Be a good employer and an employee. You want the best of school? Study hard. Be a good student, even if it's difficult. Hey, you want a good mate? Don't swipe right and swipe left. You have to, listen to me, ready? You plan your work and you work your plan. You plan your work and you work your plan. You plan your work and you work your plan. You want the best part of life? Stop living by your emotions and plan your life. And plan your life to honor God. You want a a godly mate? Then go where godly people are. Don't stop going to the stampede and drink a Jägermeister and think you're going to find Mr. Right. You're going to find Mr. Drunk Idiot that can do some this stuff. Okay, so I'm speaking to the right people. You know what I'm talking about. Okay, good. Ready? Here's the point. You want good in your life? Then then pursue God and plan it. Plan to pursue God. You want to become a godly man? Why aren't you here in the men's Bible study? We have over 100 guys that show up to the men's breakfast. Our men's group is larger than most churches in America. Men, why aren't you here? You're still hanging out with your drinking bros from college. And you're thinking, why doesn't God bless my life? Ladies, why aren't you in our men's, our women's ministry? Don't be in our men's ministry. (laughs) Unless you're a single lady looking for a good guy, then you might. Why aren't you with the godly women? You want to be a godly woman? Then why aren't you around godly women to help encourage you to be the woman of God God called you to be? Like the the point I'm making here is you have to plan those things out. In 2021, go, I'm going to be at every men's thing because I'm a man. I'm going to be at every woman's thing because I'm a woman. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a college student. I'm going to be at every rise thing on Tuesday nights. Like, if you want to be godly, be around godly people. You have to plan that though, and then do it. Feelings don't make you godly. Plans of being godly make you godly. Plan your work and work your plan. Plan your work and work your plan. Plan to be godly and then work it. Here's our principle. While there was no doubt about how the victory came about, because it was all God in this victory, there was also no doubt about who God used either. Wow. You know why I'm speaking about this guy named Gideon 3,000 years later? It's because he was faithful. You want to be used by God? I don't even know why I'm continuing to wave this thing around, but listen up. Ready? You want to be used by God? You want people to look at you and go, man, that's a woman of God. 
want people to look at you and go, man, God's really using that guy. You want people to look at you and go, hey, there, there's somebody that God's, God's using their life. Then you have to be the person God's called you to be and not worry about your emotional state. Make your decisions based on what's true, not on how you feel. And what's true is this, God loves you and God wants to do great things in your life. And you know where great things come from? Great things often come from planning and going through hard work. Don't go back to your addictions. Don't go back to your coping mechanisms. Go forward in Jesus. Stop living your life and your emotional state on a piece of glass in your hand. It can be a great tool, but it can also be addictively destructive because it teaches you that this is where my life is, is on this piece of glass rather than my life is in Jesus and I pursue him. And the good, good comes from him, not this, not this phone. Lastly, number three, God gives victory after the battle. Number one, God precedes the battle. I'm gonna put this horn down before I hurt myself. Ready? You will have many battles this year. Be encouraged. God has already gone ahead of you into 2021. He's already ahead of you, son. So trust him. Trust God. Don't be scared. Don't be scared of getting COVID. Don't be scared of getting sick. Don't be scared of what goes on. Be smart and trust God. Be smart and trust God. Don't live in fear, live in faith. Because if you live in fear, you will make fearful decisions. And some churches weren't even open for a year because they made fearful decisions rather than faith decisions. In the time when people needed them, they tapped out. And don't let that be true of me or you. Live our lives smart, but always pursuing Jesus, never living in fear. Number three, God gives victory after the battle. God caused the army to panic, thinking the torches represented legions of men up in the foothills. And the army fled in the dark, fighting each other. Israel shout, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon, while surrounding the camp, signified that just as the little roll of bread tore down the tent in the soldier's dream, so the, the power of God turns the weak into the mighty. Woo! Hey, what believers are called to do, they are given the power to accomplish. Isn't that beautiful? Look at it. God gives victory after the battle, but put up my principle. What believers are called to do, they are given power to accomplish. You know what this is? Look at me. You know what this is right here? This is success of your marriage. Does God want your marriage to thrive? Yep. Is it going to take some work from you to make your marriage thrive? Yep. Does God want the good in your life? Absolutely. Is God going to bring you to a battle though where you could tap out and not go through it? Yep. So my encouragement to you is this. When those battles come, fight through in faith. Fight through in faith. Why? Because what he's called you to, he'll give you the power to accomplish. To be the woman of God he's called you to be, to be the man of God he's called you to be. He's not, he hasn't left us powerless. He's given us the power, but God won't do the fighting for us. We got to fight through the difficulty. We got to be the godly people. But God is with us in the difficulty. With the army fractured and fleeing, Gideon's men pursue various groups and call out other Israelite tribes to help. In a short time, Gideon has gone from hiding to guiding, cowardly to confident, horrified to heroic. Capturing two of the kings, the Ephraimites sent their heads back to Gideon, showing that the impossible is possible with God. And I leave you with this. The impossible remains impossible until victory makes it possible. Wow. Guess what? If you have thoughts in your head of like, that can't be done. My marriage can't be saved. I can't ever get over that addiction. I'm, I've been addicted for blah, blah, blah. This is always my go-to thing. I'll never get over that. Listen, you've already been defeated. The issue is this. God is with me in my weakness. God is with me in my difficulty. God is with me. God is always with me. It doesn't make the difficulty go away, but it makes me strong in the difficulty. Everybody understand? That's a different way of thinking about your life. Many of you think defeat is thoughts. I can't get over that. I can't, I can't move on. I'm, I'm addicted to my emotions. And my emotions tell me I'm bad or I'm sad or I can't go, I, my life is bad. Listen, who cares how you feel? React to what's true. 
And that's that God is with you in your difficulty. God loves you through every hard time of your life. Isn't that amazing? God will never leave you or forsake you. He is always with you to give you the strength to be the man or woman of God you've been called to be.